Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural lecture that will be delivered by Professor So. I'm Anne Greenoff and I'm Head of School of Medicine. And I say, very pleased to see you all here this evening. Professor So graduated from the biochemistry department in the University of Hong Kong in 1994 with a first class honors degree. He then undertook a PhD in leukemia in the pathology department with Professor Lee Chan and won the gold medal for the best PhD thesis of the year. After a postdoctoral position in Hong Kong, Professor So moved to Stanford University in California and then to the Institute of Cancer Research in London. In 2009, Professor So joined King's College London as Professor in Leukemia and Stem Cell Biology. His current research focus is to identify novel molecular targets, in particular those involved in epigenetic regulation and stem cell function for the development of effective cancer therapeutics. I now ask Professor So to give his inaugural lecture entitled from transformation mechanism to targeted therapy, a journey of finding a cure for acute leukemia. Please. Okay. So, first of all, thank you for the kind and very generous introduction from Professor Greenoff. And it's my great honor today to give the inaugural lecture in front of you, including many of my former and current colleagues, and also old and new friends who are traveling from different parts of the world. Special thanks are given to my friends traveling from Hong Kong all the way to here to come for these special occasions. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to tell you a successful journey of finding a cure for acute pulmonocytic leukemia and also trying to explore the possibility of extending this success to other forms of acute leukemia. Although this is my inaugural lecture, I would not be standing here today without the tremendous amount of support from my families, friends, and colleagues, including many of you who are sitting here today. So before I start the academic part of the talk, I would like to introduce you some of the major contributors of the work that bring us together here today. So, just a little bit of my history. So, uh, my journey started uh, back in 1991, uh, sorry, 1971, when I was born in Hong Kong. And it was quite a difficult time to find some of these old photos when I can really see myself there. And, if you're looking at these photos, most of the structures that in Hong Kong uh, was already demolished. So you cannot en find any of these uh, buildings through your Google map or Google image anymore. And the one who uh, keeps speaking to the camera was my father holding my sisters. And my elder sister is standing in front of me. And this cute little uh, baby, it's exactly me. It's held by my grandmother. And I was a little bit shy. It was the only one not looking at the camera. And my mother wasn't there because she was taking the photos. So now I wanted to show you the um, state of art technology at that time, which is a color photos that we've taken almost um, a few months apart. And more importantly, I wanted to introduce you to the very important person of my life, which is uh, the person who brings me to the world, my love care mother. And in these photos, actually, you can see I have quite consistent positions, which really indicate I was kind of born scientist and can make reproducible results. <laughs> and that you can also see this if you look at the brochure the sent to you of my <coughs> inaugural natures photos that being used actually I kind of have similar positions as well so that really will allow me to produce a very reproducible chipica that will pass most of the scientific scrutinies for the high profile journals 
So, but then let's go back a little bit uh, in time. So, after I was born, um, I have a very, very nice childhood, and I enjoy every moment I have, although I involve in lots of activities, extra uh, curriculum activities, but not very much into studies. So, my family has keep saying to me that I really have missed almost four years of school when I'm only interested in uh, going out to play games with my friends. So there's not much I can tell you about in the first 20 years or so of my early life. The only one event I wanted to highlight, which is relevant to the talk today, is the time when I was able to meet this um, cute little girl who become my wife now. So she has clearly has been a very major highlight of my life, give me a tremendous amount of continuous support and belief in me for what I wanted to be. And that is instrumental for um, me to become a scientist today. But when I was young, I really don't think about too much about my careers. And I never dreamed of becoming a scientist. Not until the final year of my bachelor degree when I started to work in a research lab. Um, that was led by Dr. Meha Sram, who just finished her postdoctoral training from Mill Hill with Rock Kunloff and published a very nice cell paper showing the regulation of hot genes in normal development. So that was the time I really feel uh, um, intrigued by the rapid development of molecular biology technique, which allow us to examine or even manipulate the basic unit of life, which is the DNA. And I was very intrigued by the idea of scientific discovery that may be able to make important contribution that will change uh, our life. So that after I finished my bachelor degree, I decided to stay on uh, to pursue a PhD. And being in the faculty of medicine, I was introduced to Professor uh, Li Chen Chong, uh, who also just finished his uh, training uh, with Professor Mel Groups from London and came back to Hong Kong to set up his lab after publishing a very nice nature paper discovered the long form of B-cell ABO from chronic minor leukemia. So at that point, I was offered a very challenging project to try to identify a novel translocation in acute minor leukemia, which is similar to what they have done in London, but we are looking at that in acute leukemia instead of chronic minor leukemia. And I still remember that was the time before the Human Genome Project really takes shape. And it's also the golden uh, era that for uh, disease, hunt, uh, disease gene hunting and trying to crack the DNA code for human cancer. And it was a very nicely designed PhD project that allowed me to work with a research triangle between Hong Kong, China, and the UK. And at that point, uh, Hong Kong was still a British colony. It's a small city. It's limited by the number of patients we have and also the critical mass. So, but we are connected to mainland China, which is the most populated country in the world. And at that time, we also have um, Professor Su Chen, who just came back from France received his training um, as a molecular biologist to set up his major research group in Shanghai. And that was also the time when Shanghai discovered the use of all transretinoic acid for treatment of APL, as well as the acidic trioxide. Um, so I was very lucky to be able to work with them at the very early phase of the all transretinoic acid discovery. And that really, give me a very strong impression that, or inspiration that by performing a basic research, you can really translate this into patient benefit to change the way the modern medicines work. And by working with uh, Su Chen in Shanghai, it did pay off very well. I was able to identify novel translocations from my acute leukemia patients in China in order to really speedize the process of calling this translocation breakpoint. I fly over to um, London to work with this um, legendary Professor Mel Griffiths at that point to try to identify 
these new translocations. So now in internet, you can find lots of interesting photos. I think this one is one of them. And from here, although you can see that's a quite young version of Mel, but you can already see the wisdoms irradiated from, irradiated from his eyes. And at that point, I also working very closely with Leanne um, Wittemann, that was a team leader in the ICL, as well as uh, Carlos Cardas, who was a postdoc in the same lab as well. So that was also an exciting time in the Institute of Cancer Research when they first discovered the black cum mutations found in breast cancer patients. I still remember the time when Anna Ashworth and Cornice discovered that and we all ran out forward uh, to have a drink in the pub. So I, as a PhD student, I was really fascinated by the possibility of the scientific discovery that may transform the modern medicines. And a few months later, I was very lucky, was able to make our own mark in which I was able to identify these new genes uh, involved in the AML patient we identified in China. At that point, we called this gene EEN. It stood for Eric 1119 which also indicates the translocation breakpoint in these patients. So after we identified these genes with quite a successful or satisfactory PhD, I decided to stay on in Hong Kong to continue to characterize the rest of the EM family. So altogether, we identified three different new genes named after us. And however, having done all this, we're also fully aware of the fact that at that point, the human genome project is really taking shape. And all this disease gene hunting will be done in a few years' time. So we need to move ahead of the time. I decided to uh, move to the US to start my postdoctoral training fellow with uh, Professor Michael Carey, who is a pioneer in ML leukemia, also has developed a number of very powerful assays to study the oncogenic functions of any given leukemia-associated proteins. And also at that time, I was very interested in the concept of stem cell biology, which was possibly imprinted when I was with Mel a few years ago. So then I also set up a very close collaboration with a very prominent stem cell biologist, uh, Irv Weissman, who was just a corridor down uh, my lab. So after a very fruitful five years research in Stanford, we were able to discover two major transformation mechanisms mediated by ML fusions and also the potential origin of leukemic stem cells associated with ML leukemia. So after these successful years, then I would have to decide where I wanted to set up my lab. And that's the time I got a phone call from Hong Kong from my former supervisors, uh, Li Chong Chen, and tell me that Professor Mel Gibbs is looking for a new team leader in the ICR. So he wanted to know if I would be interested in going to ICR. So although at that point I was really only focused in California, in Boston, to set up my lab, but the idea of working with Mel is really intriguing. So I decided to fly to London, to fly to London for an interview. And then I got the job offer. But in the same trip, I also went to Scotland to have an interview for a very prestigious AICR International Fellowship Award that was only given once a year. I was also very lucky, a few days later, I was told that I was given this very prestigious award that would give me over a million pounds to start my own lab, independent of the ICR start package. So that together with the male's involvement is a no-brainer for me to really to come to London to set up my lab. And that's male at that point. <laughs> And I was very lucky when I come to ICL, I was able to have a very good team of young scientists working with me. In addition to making snowmen or paying snow from time to time, they do work quite hard. And one thing when I set out to set up my lab is really, I thought to myself, I have to do something really new and novel, and that will be distinctive from what I have done from my PhD and will allow me to have enough space to develop my own domain. So I decided to look at the epigenetics and cancer stem cells. So working with such a dynamic and happy groups of people in the lab, we were able to make several major discoveries that uh, really put us into the uh, leading edge of the international research platform. But 
around that time, and then we also, the news come, is Mel started to have some discussion with ICR regarding uh, his potential retirement. And also, at that point, there were several opportunities arise, including the ones from Professor Mufti, Gunnar Mufti, and Peter Parker, that really uh, come to my radar that uh, there is a very good opportunity for me to extend my research into a slightly uh, different area that I have always been interested in, which is to really translate my finding more close to the humanized model to the patient benefits. So working with Professor Gunnar Mufti as a well authoritative for minor disease treatment, it will really help me to fulfill this part of my research work. And for Professor Peter Parker, it's clearly he's a very well known biochemist and also a cancer biologist. Together, it will give me an extremely good opportunity to move to the next stage to really translate my research funding into potential patient benefits. So I decided to join KCL in 2009 as the professor in leukemia biology and bring my teams from ICL to King's in December 2009. And that's the photo we taken a week after we settled in, have the Christmas cake. Um, and then three and a half years later, here we are, and you're listening to this history. And so that is the group of the people now we have. That's the photo we taken a month ago in Italian restaurants. And you can see some of the familiar face and also some of the new faces. And they all have contributed tremendously to the work I'm going to present here today. And also, I would like to thank again for all the people I have mentioned earlier on, and for some of them, Regardably, I don't have enough time to mention their contributions for the success of the work that we have been doing. Okay, so now we can go back to science. We still have two and a half hours left. Um, so I know we all come from different backgrounds. You may be rich or poor. You can be extremely smart or a little bit dumb. But I would thank every one of them us, we agree, we are pretty much blessed with our good health. And taking the advantage of the artistic talents of Erica, right, we have made this diagram trying to describe the journey of a leukemia patients. So while I have worked on leukemia research for over 20 years, I can only imagine it, the journey of a leukemia patient is like drifting in a deep open sea under a stormy weather, and he is totally dehydrated and exhausted. And the only thing he can hold on that will stop him from drowning is this old big lock. And even though he can see the light, very weak light from the uh, lighthouse of the drowning, he's just too weak to go there. And he is just waiting for someone to rescue him but in most of the time, he was just waiting to die. So my idea is, can we change these grimy pictures if we can give these patients the appropriate equipment? Like in this case, if we will be able to give him the boat that will take him out of the dehydrating salt water, and at the same time, if we can give him the cells that can allow him to change the directions of the boat, that will allow him to eventually reach the giant end where he will be safe again. So I guess the major questions here is how we can find this boat and also the cells that will let this uh, leukemia patients to reach the drive land or the safe lands. The question we really lie under how much we know about our enemy, in this case, leukemia. The more we know it, the better we can design the strategy to treat the leukemia patients, to bring them to a complete remission to the joint end. So now we will go back to the journey of a leukemic stem cell. So I think. In order for us to design better treatments for any disease, we have to know the biology of the disease. And in this case, I would say 
is quite similar to my personal journey, which is it will, for a normal leukemic stem cells, which we believe is the root of the disease, if you wanted to cure cancer or leukemia, you have to cure or you have to eradicate the leukemic stem cells. And the first thing we need to know is where cancer come from? What is the origin of the leukemic stem cells? Using leukemia as a model, uh, we were able to show a long time ago that uh, in normal hematopoiesis, all the blood cell formations derive from a small number of normal hematopoietic stem cells, which has the ability to self-renew, to regenerate themselves. At the same time, they will be able to give rise to some of these functional uh, progenitor, like this common lymphoid progenitor and common minor progenitor, that will give rise to all the lymphoid cell and minor cell to fight against bacterial infections and all kinds of diseases. And about 12 years ago, when I was in Stanford, we were questioning what are the potential origin of leukemic stem cells, whether they are coming from stem cells or progenitors. So at that time, we used MLL as an initiating event to test which one of this population can give rise to the acute leukemia we found in the patients. In that study, we were able to demonstrate that hematopoietic stem cell is the only populations that can give rise to multi lineage leukemia, whereas if we want to have acute minor leukemia, both hematopoietic stem cell as well as committed minor progenitor can result in AML. And we all know stem cell and progenitor have a very different biological features. So that's also possibly the leukemic stem cell derived from normal stem cell and progenitor will also have different biological properties as well as respond to the disease treatment. And, but at that time, after we know MLL, or one of the initiating events is required for conversion of a normal cell into a leukemic stem cell, it's not enough to really become a full-blown leukemic stem cell. It's like getting a PhD is the beginning of the process. You need to have an advanced P, uh, postdoctoral training to become a competent team leader. So for P leukemic stem cell, it also require to have additional genetic or epigenetic mutations that will allow them to convert into full bone leukemic stem cells. And that's the one that really drive the disease and sustain the disease. And from the beautiful work um, done by Professor Mel Griffiths, we also know that there's a huge con uh, heterogeneities during the disease progressions. There are not of genetic mutations could take place, depending on them whether they're taking place in the stem cell or are more mature progenitors. They may have functional meaning, but most of them may not have functional consequences. Having said that, that will still give rise to huge heterogeneities we see in the AML patients when the disease is presented. But when we see the patients, usually the first thing happened to them is we will give them chemotherapy, which is a highly toxic cytotoxic drug that target highly proliferative cells. So that will allow us to eliminate most of the highly proliferative uh, leukemic progenitors or mature cells. However, we know that the leukemic stem cells, which are usually coincidence of or have acquired um, additional property, they will be resistant to this chemotherapeutic uh, agents. But having said that, because most of the, the bulk of the tumor actually are made up of the uh, mature leukemic cells, so the patient will still be able to enter into complete remissions. But with time, when the leukemic stem cells start to expand again, the patient will relapse. And that will be the time we see the patient coming back to the hospital and become resistant again to the treatments. So by having this in mind, as a, to have a very brief concept of the journey of a cancer stem cell, or leukemic stem cell, we think that at least two approach we can use to target or in eradicate the leukemic stem cells. One of the first one is we can target the initiating events that we can find in all the cancer cells. And also from the disease model we have so far, we know that the initiating events such as ML fusions is required even at the very late stage of disease development. So if you can inactivate ML fusion or its function, it will be able to eradicate the leukemic stem cell even when it becomes a full-blown leukemia. 
And that is the one that I will spend most of my time to talk about it. And then at the end, I will also talk very briefly the second approach that we can potentially use to target leukemic stem cell, which is the cell renewal pathway. They are hydrated by the leukemic stem cell that are possibly dispensable for the normal stem cells. So these are the two major areas that I will touch on in today's talk. And the first one I want to talk about is acute pulmonocytic leukemia, which is characterized by the presence of immature pulmonocytes um, in the bone marrow or in the peripheral blood. And clinically, it's characterized by excessive uh, internal bleedings and typical infections due to the compromise of the uh, blood cell uh, formations or normal hematopoiesis. And it wasn't clear at that time whether acute pulmonocytic leukemia is a single disease or is a group of heterogeneous disease. Whether it's a, what is the cause of this disease as well? Not until early 1970, when this lady, Janet Riley, has discovered, made some several major discovery, reporting common cytogenetics abnormalities finding acute leukemia patients, including this particular one, the 1517 translocation, finding every single acute pulmonocytic leukemia patients. That was the finding, clearly tell us that APL is a homogeneous disease that is possibly induced by these genetic abnormalities due to the chromosome translocation between chromosome 15 and 17. And a schematic diagram for what was happening is the chromosome 15 and 17 will have an abnormal exchange of materials between these two chromosomes and create what we call derivative chromosome 15 and derivative chromosome 17. But it was still not clear what exactly happened at the genetic level. We only discovered the genes that are being disrupted by this translocation almost 10 years later when we have proper molecular biology technique. So a number of groups, including uh, Alan Solomons in Kings now, and also Hildetes in France, at that time they were able to discover the genes called PML on chromosome 15 and retinol S receptor alpha in chromosome 17, was able to form these fusion proteins as a result of chromosome translocations. And that was a major finding that allowed us to really start to look at the molecular mechanisms, how this translocation or the fusion proteins in induce the leukemic phenotype we see in the patients. And almost at the same time, there was a new concept that instead of trying to kill the leukemic cell using highly toxic cytogenetic drugs, you may be able to differentiate them. So in other words, instead of fighting your enemy to die to the death, you can try to educate them and neutralize them to allow them to become part of the society again. And actually, it made quite a lot of sense because cancer cell eventually that was derived from our normal cells as well. So when we talk about this, also formed the basic principle of the first successful targeted defensorism therapy. And these two men, or the two pioneers, has contributed hugely to the success of the uh, all transcutaneous acid treatment in APL. The first one, in the left-hand side is Professor uh, Wang Zhenyi. He is the first one to introduce all transretinoid acid, a vitamin derivative, for, success, for successful treatment of acute pulmonocytic leukemia. And the one in the left-hand side, you may still recognize him, is Professor Xu Chen, uh, where it should. And he is now a health minister in China, and he spent a lot of time and effort trying to understand the molecular mechanisms of all transretinoid acid. He's also the only health minister in the world who's still active in basic scientific research. He's still publishing high-profile uh, scientific paper, even a science paper, just a year ago. So when I was working with them uh, 10 years ago, when I was still uh, a PhD student, really inspired me that targeted therapy is the way to go to really can make the difference that will translate the basic research into patient benefits. And that's why we decided to go back and look at the transformation mechanisms mediated by PML R alpha to see whether we will be able to even improve the treatment response. As I mentioned earlier on, 
acute pulmonocytic leukemia is a result of the retinoid acid fusions. And that is remarkably sensitive to all chance treatment. It has the use, the successful use of all chance retinoid acid has transformed this fatal, this highly fatal disease to a much more manageable disease. Although I have to say that there's still a significant number of patients that still become relapse and resistant to all trans retinoid acid treatment. So there's still a important need for us to have better understanding the molecular mechanism um, mediated by this fusion proteins for transformation and also how all trans trigger the defense fusion therapies. So a few years ago, we decided to try to understand these mechanisms and the work that mainly uh, done by Bern Sysik and Colin Koch in my lab was able to discover their three major components that are critical for the oncogenic functions of PML R and alpha fusions. So if you imagine this uh, production bell, I say production knife for making the oncogenic R and alpha fusions in APL, the three essential steps are required. So the first one is the PML R and alpha has to form a tetramer. They will allow them to have enhanced DNA binding abilities as well as the recruitment of the COVID passer uh, um, complex. And the second step is the binding or the recruitment of the RXR, the DNA binding cofactor. They will enhance or to confer the DNA binding specificities to the downstream target genes. And finally, the first step is the recruitment of the transcriptional repressor complex that will allow the PML R alpha to shut off the expression of downstream target genes. So then how about the basic principle? What is the principle for the target therapy in APL? So as I mentioned earlier on, the way it transforms the fuse, the way it transforms normal cell into pedochemic stem cell is full aberrant recruitment of co -replacers. And we also know that the way the all trans retinoid acid work is to bind to the PML R alpha to induce a conformational change, and that will replace the transcriptional replacer with a transcriptional activator that will need to transcriptional dereplacements of the downstream target genes that are critical for differentiations. However, when we worked this review, we didn't know what are the coactivator that are responsible for the all trans retinoid acid treatment response. So then we decided to identify this coactivator to see if we can manipulate this coactivator activity to further improve the treatment response in APL. So this work was mainly pioneered or done by Mary Francis in my lab. A few years ago, we decided to screen for this Jumanji family of histone demethanase, which is a new class of uh, histone modifying enzyme with a very important function for transcriptional regulations. So what she has done or discovered is one of these histone demethanase called PHFA was able to interact differentially with uh, PML R alpha in response to all trans retinoid acid treatment. And PHFA has this JMJC catheter domain that will mediate the histone methanations. Uh, At the same time, at the 5 part end, it has a PHD domain that will allow it to recognize and bind the histone mark. Without showing you all the biochemical and transcriptional data, we were able to demonstrate that PHFA actually can remove the uh, H3K9 repressive mark and protect the H3K4 activation mark. And to recruit transcriptional activator complex that drive the expression of downstream target genes. So it fit very well with the transcriptional coactivator property that we were looking for this novel coactivator that may be critical for APL response to all trans treatment. But we still have to demonstrate whether that's really critical for the APL uh, cell differentiations. As I mentioned earlier on, APL cells are uniquely sensitive to all trans retinal acid treatment. And in this diagram, it's showing you this particular uh, MB4 cell line derived from APL patients that under physiological level of all trans retinal acid, the cells are resistant to differentiations. They still form this uh, very compact colony. Only at the pharmacological level of all trans 10 to the minus 6, then the APL cells start to differentiate. But what we have shown now is if you overexpress PHFA in the APL cells, actually you can sensitize the cells to all trans treatment, even in the physiological level of all trans retinoid acid. 
And we also demonstrate that this activity is completely depending on the catenary domain of PHFA. Because if you make a single pawn mutation that disrupts the catenary activity of PHFA, you lose this suppression activities. And this activity is also highly specific to the APL cells because if we use a CML cell 9, you will not be able to trigger any differentiations. So APL that contain in the PML R alpha are responsible for this treatment response. And we can also reproduce this phenomenon or results using most, a very clean mouse models we have, which the mouse leukemic cells either are driven by PML R alpha or a derivative fusion called PLCF RA alpha. But overexpressing PM, uh, PHFA, you can significantly suppress the transformation abilities, and all these activities are depending on the catenitic uh, activities. And you wouldn't see that in the controls where the cells are transformed by totally different fusions. And on the other hand, if you don't regulate PHFA in APL cells, you see exactly the opposite. The cells become resistant to the APL, to the all transretinal acid treatment, no matter the cell is the human APL cells or coming out from our mouse model. If you lock down the expression of PHFA, then the cells become resistant to the treatment. Even you treat them with all transretinal acid, they are totally resistant. You are not able to differentiate them. And consistently, we were able to detect reduce the level of PHFA expression in the APL cell 9 that are resistant to all transretinal acid treatment. Sony indicates that PHFA level may actually act as a gatekeeper to regulate all trans sensitivities. So now the next question is, can we really activate uh, PHFA to sensitize all trans resistant cells to the treatment again? So the result is, yes, we could. When we use this APL cell uh, derived from a patient that resistant to the all trans treatment, we were able to make it sensitive to the treatment again by expressing the PHFA in these cells. Again, this response are depending on the catalytic activities. And the response is also with, uh, in proportion or directly related to its ability to activate the downstream targeting expressions. And it's not just in vitro. We can also see this in vivo. If you put PHFA into this all trans retinal acid resistant cell 9 and then transplant it into a not skip mouse and treat this mouse with all trans retinal acid, then you can significantly extend the disease latency of the mouse. And again, this activity is highly dependent on the catalytic activities of PHFA. If you make a single pawn mutation, you lose this activity altogether. So this result strongly indicates that PHFA is a gatekeeper to modulate the all trans sensitivity. And that is also dependent on the catalytic activity of PHFA. So the next question is, what are the molecular mechanisms that regulate PHFA activity and the modes of actions in APL? So the first hint actually is come, it came from this Nature paper published a few years ago, where they showed that PHFA actually can bind to a chromatin and up from phosphorylations by uh, CDK1, PHFA will be phosphorylated in two specific sites and it will detach from the chromatin and replaced by PR7 and condensing two complex. And we know all trans retinoid acid actually can induce nuclear translocation of CDK1, and that will possibly um, mediate the phosphorylation of PHFA, and that will make PHFA detach from the naive promoter and become available for other uh, the PML R alpha fusions. So, in order to test this hypothesis, we were able to demonstrate that if you treat the APL cells with uh, all trans retinoid acid, actually you indeed induce the phosphorylation of PHFA. And moreover, if you treat the cells with all trans retinoid acid, PHFA will specifically bind or recruited by the PML R alpha to bind to the downstream target genes, and they will dissociate, on the other hand, from their naive promoters. And it's not just the binding, but also, they will also mediate the necessary transcriptional uh, epigenetic mark 
including removal of the H3K9 methylation mark and the enrichment of the K4 activation mark as well as the K9 activation mark. And it can do it for all the PML our alpha downstream target gene we have examined. So this result strongly indicates that one of the functions of PHFA is really is to be recruited by the PML our alpha by the downstream target genes uh, to, act, to activate the expression of downstream target genes. And to determine whether this activity is really um, conferred by the CDK1, then we try to see whether we can replace the all trans acid functions by co-expressing CDK1 together with PHFA. As we saw, we were able to demonstrate that by co-expressing these two factors together in APL cells that are resistant to all trans acid treatment, you can activate the expression of PML R alpha downstream target genes. At the same time, you can reduce the colony formations of the APL resistant cells and also trigger its defense reactions. So it strongly indicates that CDK1 does play a very important role in mediating the all trans acid response through PHFA. And to further narrow it down whether those two phosphorylation sites are mediated, uh, I mentioned earlier to you, that are critical for the PHFA activity, we also created two uh, sophisticated uh, single pond mutants that mutated the serine in these two residues into either uh, alanine that will mimic the high pole phosphorylated PHFA or to mutate it to aspirate acid that will mimic the high the PHFA. By inducing the expression of these two different forms of PHFA, we were able to override the requirement of all trans acid to trigger the differentiation of APL, with, uh, APL cells that are resistant to the uh, all trans acid treatment by expressing the, um, the DD form of PHFA that mimic the high uh, status, but not the AA form, which is a high perphosphorylated form. And this activity is also dependent on the catenated functions of PHFA, because if you make a single pawn mutant at the catenated domain, you completely lose the uh, suppression properties. And that also directly correlates with the transcriptional activation property of these mutants. The DD mutants can significantly activate the expression of the downstream target of PML R alpha. And it's not just in vitro, but also in vivo. If you put the cells into the mouse, and that expressing the PHFA, the DD mutants, actually, this mouse would develop leukemia with much longer disease latency, in the, even in the absence of all trans acid. So this result, again, strongly indicates that one of the major functions of the all trans is to induce the phosphorylation of PHFA that will become accessible by the PML alpha to turn on the downstream target genes that are critical for differentiation of the leukemic bars. So next is, can we pharmacologically inhibit PHFA phosphorylations to enhance the epigenetic therapy that we use in APL patients nowadays? So we decided to screen for a small molecules that can inhibit the uh, dephosphorylations of PHFA. And we were, we were able to identify this organolic acid that can suppress the dephosphorylation property or that can suppress the dephosphatase that remove the phosphorylation mark of PHFA. And in this slice, that shows you that in the APL cells that are resistant to all trans acid treatment, if you treat them with organoid acid in the presence of PHFA, actually, you can significantly reduce the colony forming abilities but not in those cells that express the AA or DD mutants that are no longer sensitive to the phosphorylation or dephosphorylation modifications. And we can even see this result in a more, much more pronounced way if you treat these cells with organoid acid together with all trans acid. You can significantly suppress the colony formation abilities in those cells that express PHFA. And not for the one that express the mutants, you don't see a huge difference at all when you add the organoid acid together with all trans. So we further demonstrate that in this case, 
you don't really need to overexpress PHFA in those cells because overexpressing PHFA is a very difficult genetic manipulation that you try to Im implement in the patients. So we were able to demonstrate here that you can simply treat the APL cells that are resistant to all transretinoic acid, but together with 15 uh, or 0.5 micromolar of organoic acid, you can significantly suppress the coronary formation ability mediated by this fusion, uh, this uh, APL uh, cells that resist originally resistant to the all trans. And you don't see this uh, using a uh, chronic minor leukemia cell lines. Again, it strongly indicates that organoic acid in, combine, in combinations with all trans retinoic acid could represent potential therapeutic uh, agents for treating acute pulmonocytic leukemia patients that are resistant to the all trans retinoic acid treatment. And the way it works, it seems that um, the organoic acid in combination with all trans can significantly enhance the expression of PML R alpha downstream target genes and also trigger the differentiations of the APL cells. And it's not just again in vitro, we can also see this in vivo. If we transplant these APL cells to the mouse and then just treat the mouse with organoid acid together with all trans retinoid acid, you can significantly extend the disease latency even though these lines originally are resistant to the all trans retinoid acid treatments. So to summarize this part of the talk, we believe that in APL cells, PMLR-alpha will recruit co-repressor complex to shut off the expression of downstream target genes that are critical for cell differentiations. And upon all trans retinoid acid treatment, um, sorry, PHFA will be phosphorated and detached from the naive promoter and being recruited by the PML R alpha and that will be able to remove the repressive mark such as the H3K9 methylation mark and that will be replaced by the activation mark and to recruit RNA polymerase 2 and the coactivator complex to drive the expression of downstream target genes that are critical for cell differentiations. I think that forms a basic principle of the differentiation therapy and we also show you that if we can manipulate the activity of PHFA by inhibiting the phosphorylation uh, status of of PHFA, you will be able to enhance or to resurrect the all trans sensitivity to the APL resistant cells. So going back to this relatively gloomy pictures we drew earlier on, in order to really help these leukemia patients to reach this drive land, we think in the APL, we will be able to give back the boat to him in which was symbolized by the retinoid acid and also at the top, we can also give him the sales, which is PHFA, that will allow them to determine the direction of the boat. Eventually, he will be able to drive to the dry land to be safe again. So, so far I've talked about the success we have achieved in APL. The next question is whether we can translate this success to other leukemia. After all, APL, account for 10% of acute minor leukemia, and so far it's the only successful target therapy in acute leukemia, or even for most of the sonic tumors. So if we can extend this success to other leukemia, that may be a big step forward for us to find a cure for other form of acute leukemia. Having involved in the early stage of the APL development myself, I, I personally believe we can translate this success to other leukemia, including the one that involved 11Q23 translocation, involving the mixed lineage leukemia genes, a subject that's very close to my heart as well. So we know the MLL of the mixed lineage leukemia gene will form a huge transcriptional complex that will recruit transcriptional coactivator components that will have the H3K4 transmuvenation activity to turn on the expression of downstream target genes such as HOTS that are critical for stem cell cell renewal functions. And if the stem cell needs to differentiate, the HOTS genes has to be inactivated. So in some way, MLL has to come off from the promoter to allow silencing of the HOTS genes. And what happened in leukemia patients with 11Q23 translocation is 
the ML will fuse with one of the fusion partner, and that will constitutively turn on the expression of downstream target genes, and that will apparently keep renewing this abnormal stem or progenitor cells that will occupy the whole bone marrow, and eventually the patient will die of the bone marrow failure. So the question we wanted to ask is whether we can identify the transcriptional complex that associate with this novel ML fusion complex, and also what are the epigenetic mark or what are the epigenetic reprogramming being made by the ML fusions to consistently turn on the downstream target genes. If we can identify them, maybe we can design novel strategy to target this fusion protein to eradicate the ML leukemic stem cells. So now we will go back on this fusion protein, MLEN, we identified more than 15 years ago when I was a PhD student. And this project was, was mainly uh, led by Michael Jan in my lab. We decided to really to look back to find out why this ML fusions we transform, we induce leukemia in the patients at the first place. So Michael was able to identify a mini complex associated with ML fusion through the acid free domain. It will recruit a protein called SAM68, uh, which will recruit the protein called CBP and PRMT1. Those are two epigenetic modifying enzymes that will confer the histone acetonation mark as well as the H3R3. Uh, H4R3 methylation mark. Together, they will drive the expression of downstream target genes, including HOTS, that are critical for leukemic transformations. And we were also able to demonstrate that by suppressing either the expression of sam 6 or PRMT1 using SHRNA approach, you can specifically suppress oncogenic transformation mediated by MLEN. And this activity, transformation activity, is also absolutely dependent on the PRMT1 enzymatic uh, functions as well. So by identifying the key components or epigenetic components that are required for this form of ML leukemia, we have further um, investigate whether we can develop novel therapeutic strategy by targeting the PRMT1. In this case, we use a novel inhibitors that will be able to suppress the enzymatic activity of PRMT1. You can see here, the H4R3 H3, the H3 might significantly com uh, compromise upon the treatment of this drug. And not just the molecular functions, but also we can significantly suppress the transformation mediated by ML fusions um, upon the, the treatment of these drugs, both in vitro as well as in vivo. They can significantly extend the disease latency by treating the mouse that carry the MLEM fusions or ML fusions with this PRMT1 inhibitors. So strongly indicates that if we can develop or identify the key component that are critical for some of this oncogenic associated fusion protein and design small molecule inhibitor to target them, we may be able to eradicate some of this disease. Uh, in parallel of our study, actually that's also the time when the first dot one inhibitor was developed by this biotech uh, company called Epizyme in collaboration with Scott Armstrong in Boston a year ago. And that is a very nice of proof of principle experiments that was demonstrated by this company that they were able to develop one of these dot one inhibitors that target uh, the dot one which mediated the H3 K79 histone mark, which I don't have time to go through it today, but that is the other mark that are also specifically recruited by or conferred by several ML fusions. And by developing this inhibitor, they were able to demonstrate a very good in ritual efficacy in suppressing the oncogenic transformation. And it's also quite well tolerated in the mouse, although the in vivo efficacy can still have room for improvement. But this drug now has just entered into phase one clinical trials and also bring this company huge amount of incomes. And from the last, um, the recent IOP, uh, the offer last week, actually, the company now has value up to 500 million US dollars because of this drug. So I think at this point, we all think that by identifying some of the key components that are critical for oncogenic transformation, we allow us to target or eradicate several leukemic uh, stem cells. And in this case, to summarize what we have talked about earlier on is here in the ML fusions, we believe that 
the normal MLL can form a huge transcriptional complex that regulate expression of downstream target genes such as HOTS that are critical for stem cell functions. But in leukemia, what happens is they will, the leukemia fusion protein, the MLY, like we could the PRMT1, or a different class of ML fusions, called MLX, we could dot one. And if we, if we can design small molecule inhibitor to specifically target either PRMT1 or dot one, then we will be able to specifically eradicate either MLY transformed cells or MLX transformed cells that will allow us to develop a novel therapeutic strategy to target the root of the disease or the initiating events of the disease. Um, indeed, we also think we can apply the very similar principle to other kinds of acute leukemia as well. In this case, we think the AML ETO, which accounts for about 10%, 5% to 10% of AML, which we believe that we can also apply a similar principle to this cause of leukemia. These are the work mainly done by Cronin Corp as well as uh, burn size in the lab. If you imagine this devil here is AML ETO, it's the oncoproteins. In order for them to complete this uh, leukemic uh, transformation of the puzzle, they will have to work together and more importantly, they have to use specific tools. In this case, it's transcriptional co-replacers in order to really put the last piece of the puzzles together to induce oncogenic transformations. But if we can identify the key component or the tools they use to make these puzzles complete, we will be able to similarly design specific therapeutic strategy to target them. So, we strongly believe that in addition to APL, which I have spent lots of time to talk about this today, we can also apply a similar principle to ML leukemia involving 11 q 2 3 translocations, as well as the X21 translocation, the ML1 feed, uh, ETO fusions. And there are already a number of um, small molecule inhibitors that show promise of targeting some of these leukemia fusions. So the coming years, really the exciting eras to come for target therapies. So now I have gone through the route of targeting the initiating events to improve the clinical remission and to minimize the clinical relapse. And the next thing I wanted to talk very, very briefly for the interest of the time is the self-renewal pathway. Can we target them to eradicate leukemic stem cells? And this work is mainly done by three very talented postdocs in my lab. I will only um, summarize what they have found for the interest of the time. So the first one was done by Lennon Smith in the lab with the help with Jenny Yan. And what she has found now is there is a novel cross talk between ML HOTS and BMI1 in, in the maintenance of the cell renewal pathway in the leukemic stem cell. So what you have found out is hot genes as well as BMI1 actually they together acting as a break to stop the cells getting into senescence, which is a status like a permanent sleep mode in your computers or iPad. If we, once you get there, they will sleep forever. So which is a good thing if you can do it for cancer cell. And what we have found out at that point is for some of the leukemic stem cells, those are driven by AML ETO or PML RA alpha. They're absolutely dependent on BMI1 to confer this break, to stop them entering senescence. If you can decide small molecule inhibitor or therapeutic approach to target BMI1, you can possibly eradicate AML ETO leukemic stem cell or PML RA alpha leukemic stem cell. But on the other hand, for the MLL leukemic stem cell, because its ability to activate hot genes, which can allow it to override the requirement of BMI1 to put a break into its license. So for ML leukemic stem cell, in order to suppress its oncogenic transformation, you have to target both the BMI1 as well as the hot pathway in order to achieve a long-term complete remission. And use a US highway as a metaphor, I think if you imagine the MLL fusions, if it's in the driver's seat, then it will be totally independent of BMI1 because it can have alternative pathway to activate or to suppress the uh, senescence pathway. However, 
if the driver is actually mediated by AML1 ETO, that they're pretty much dependent on BMI1. If you block this way, then pretty much you will be able to suppress the oncogenic transformation, stopping them to become a leukemic stem cell. And the next work, or the final work I want to mention to you, is the work uh, mainly done by um, Jenny Yan with the help with um, Mary, Mary Teresa Esposito in the lab. So what they have found now is they were able to discover a protein called beta catenin that was defensively upregulated during the development of a leukemic stem cell associated with ML leukemia. They were able to show that if you can suppress or lock down the expression of beta catenin, you will be able to convert a leukemic stem cell back to a pure leukemic stem cell status. If you can totally eliminate beta catenin from the system, then this normal cell would never be able to develop, become a leukemic stem cell, even you have the ML fusions. And more interestingly, beta catenin is absolutely dispensable for normal stem cell functions. So that really highlighted the possibility of targeting beta catenin for eradication of ML leukemic stem cells. So together, I think this talk, I have to tell you the potential or the promise of targeting some of the essential components associated or required for the development of the leukemic stem cell. If we can identify and de develop small molecule inhibitor to target some of this component, we will be able to improve the clinical remissions and minimize the relapse in the leukemia patients. I would like to end this talk by acknowledging the people who really contribute hugely to the work, including many of my collaborators in different parts of the work. And of course, this work will not be possible without the people in the lab and the funding agents who have been believing me to support the work. And last but not the least, and thank you very much for your attention and coming to this lecture. Thank you very much. Um, I now call on Professor Peter Parker, Head of Division, to give a vote of thanks. So Eric and uh, all who've come this afternoon um, to thank you really for a spectacular and passionate uh, description of your journey uh, through leukemic research. Um, I think you've given us an inspiring view of that journey and all of the genetic and epigenetic changes and insights that you have contributed to that have really changed a lot of what our understanding is. And I think in particular to, to say that the, the depth of insight that has come from the sorts of information that you have gathered uh, and your description of that depth of knowledge and how that is impacting uh, in treatments I think is, has been superb. So really a, a vote of thanks uh, to you for a really wonderful lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree we've had a superb lecture. Please let's go and celebrate it by joining in the reception, uh, joining in the atrium for a reception. <laughs>